Hi, I'm Kevin Hartley and welcome to Kevin Hartley Photography in my office. This is a channel that I've set up to share my experiences of wildlife and nature with others. So let's go. Hi and welcome to part two of my wildlife series on exposure. And in this video, part two, we're going to look at exposure modes. Understanding the, the different types of camera modes is essential if you want to be able to control your exposure. You need to know what each of the modes do and when to use it in wildlife photography and we'll cover them as we go through. What the camera modes allow you to do is to control the details of an exposure as we looked at in part one which was to do with the exposure triangle and in that we looked at the aperture, the shutter speed and the ISO. Once you have an understanding of the exposure triangle the next step is to look at exposure modes. So what we'll do in this video, we'll look at metering modes and how the camera reads light. We'll look at the different camera modes and how they control different aspects of the exposure triangle. And we'll look at one or two things that allow us to be able to read our exposure settings as we're actually photographing. Namely the histogram and the highlight alerts. And it will all be in relation to wildlife photography. When we look through the viewfinder of our, our cameras to take a photograph, this is what we, the photographer, see. And in this picture you'll see a nice white swan with a, a bright orange bill, the water reflecting off the surface. That's what we see. However, our cameras light meter see something completely different. And what a light meter sees and measures is different to what we see with our human eye. Why is that, you may ask? Well, the light, me the light meter measures reflective light off the subject. So, when the camera's looking at the subject, the light that's reflecting off that subject is what the camera reads. And what the camera reads is what is known as middle grey. The light meter sees in a range of tones between, on the one side, on the left hand side, darkest black, to the right hand side, brightest white. And sitting in the middle is what's known as middle grey. So all cameras by default measure light so that every image goes to middle grey. And it's very important to remember that. So dark black to bright white with middle grey sitting in the middle. To define it simply, middle grey is the very centre tone between absolute black and absolute white. So in bright light what will happen is that the camera will bring the exposure to middle grey and it will underexpose your image. In low light or dark light what will happen is that the camera will bring the exposure to middle grey thereby overexposing your image. So the camera meter will always try to bring the light levels to middle grey which is the default and it's very important to remember that. What we'll look at now is the different types of metering modes that are available and I'll give you um, a couple of recommendations that I believe are the right metering modes for wildlife photography. Choosing a metering mode is just as important as choosing your aperture or your ISO to get the correct exposure. Depending on what camera you've got and the model that you've got will depend on what that system actually calls the metering mode. Canon is different from Nikon, Nikon is different from Panasonic etc. So you need to understand the metering modes for your camera but they all virtually do exactly the same thing. Uh, I shoot with Canon but it doesn't matter what system you shoot with the metering modes are, are the same. I'd suggest that approximately about 95% of wildlife photographers are going to be using one mode more than any other and that's evaluative or matrix mode the majority of the time. If you're a beginner to wildlife photography I would recommend that you set your camera up for evaluative metering, get to understand what evaluative metering is all about and what it does is it measures light across the whole of the scene and then it takes an average and then it uses that average remember going to middle grey, get to understand what evaluative metering is how it works with your camera before you look at any other metering mode. And there really is, based on experience and, and based on watching the top photographers that are out there, really only one other metering mode that they use for wildlife photography and that's spot metering. But as I said, if you're a beginner, get to understand the evaluative or matrix metering first and then go to have a look at using spot metering but only once you're happy to do so. So let's look at evaluative metering first. As I said, it considers the whole scene and then it averages out the amount of light to use to expose your image correctly. Evaluative metering is mainly used when you've got evenly lit scenes where the sun's out all day long or you've got constant shade and the light is pretty much average all over. 
voltage metering. The other one is spot metering and this is whereby the camera meter is looking at a specific spot on the subject within your frame and ignores everything else. So it's just measuring light off that one part of your image. And that's mainly used on backlit images, silhouettes, high, cost, high contrast situation and things like um, snowy landscapes or snowy scenes. So what would I recommend uh, if you're a beginner to wildlife photography and especially something like bird photography? Use evaluative or matrix metering. Set your camera up for that, get to know it, get to understand it, how your camera operates, the type of images that you're getting. And once you've done that, then think about considering spot metering too, but only after you're happy with evaluative metering. Next we're going to look at camera modes which are designed to be used in different situations to control your exposure. The dial for the, the, the camera mode is situated uh, normally on the top of your camera so depending on what make you've got will depend on where that dial is situated on top of the camera. So what I want to do now is go through each of those camera modes and how they relate to wildlife photography and how they affect your exposure. First ones we're going to look at are what is known as the automatic modes. On the automatic mode you have absolutely no control whatsoever over your exposure settings. The camera sets everything, the aperture, the shutter, the ISO, you have no control over it and that's not good for wildlife photography, you need control. We then have a set of settings in the camera modes which is known as the scene modes. Again you have absolutely no control over your exposure settings. What I'm going to suggest to you now is that if you're using either automatic or any of the scene modes for wildlife photography then I strongly advise you to try and stop using them and use one of the camera modes that I'm going to recommend to you next. And what we'll do now is we'll now look at the four main modes on your camera that you can set to control your exposure setting. Of the four main camera mode settings, the well, first one we're going to start off with, with is the P mode, which is the program mode. Uh, and again, the camera chooses the aperture and the shutter speed. I'm going to advise you that it's not a good mode to be using for wildlife photography. There are better modes to use, as you're about to find out. Then we have shutter priority. In shutter priority, you, the photographer, you set the shutter speed and the camera decides on the aperture. In wildlife photography, depth of field is so important. We need to be able to have complete control of our aperture to control that depth of field. It's not a, a, a recommendation to use shutter priority for wildlife or bird photography because you need to control that depth of field. That then moves us on to A mode, which is the aperture priority mode. Here, you're gonna choose the aperture. The camera is then gonna decide the shutter speed. This is the mode that I would recommend, if you're a beginner to wildlife or bird photography, this is the mode that I would recommend that you start with, is aperture priority. It gives you more control, as I said, because depth of field is so important in wildlife photography. The next camera mode that I want to talk about is a combined mode and it's you set your camera to manual and you also set it to auto ISO. This is my go-to camera mode setting and I think you'll find that a lot of wildlife photographers and bird photographers prefer auto ISO. All I do is I set my aperture, I set my shutter speed and then I set it to auto ISO. Now once I've done that I completely forget all about the ISO. I just let the camera do what it's got to do. So therefore, I've only got two things to concentrate on, the aperture and the shutter speed. 95% of the time, once I've set my aperture, I leave it and I don't touch it. The only thing I then need to worry about is my shutter speed. And I can control my shutter speed with one finger, in other words, my thumb on the back of the camera. So setting the camera to manual and to auto ISO, I have a lot of control over my cam camera, but it is still a automatic camera mode and it's important to, to, to remember this it's an automatic camera mode when you use any of those modes so whether it's shutter priority aperture priority or manual with auto ISO they're considered as automatic and that means that the camera still has a say in the exposure setting remember when we talked about the gray scale and, and middle gray that camera is always looking at that and that's whereby exposure compensation comes in and that's what we're going to look at in part three, how we can then make quick adjustments on our camera as we're actually taking our images to get the correct exposure. And I'll cover exposure compensation in part three. The final camera mode I want to just briefly talk about is manual mode. And in manual mode, there are no automatic settings whatsoever. 
So you the photographer, you set the aperture, you set the, the shutter speed and you set the ISO. The camera has no say whatsoever. So you are in complete control. And you normally find that a lot of people, especially as beginners, I was exactly the same. When it comes to manual mode, it's um, an area that you, you step around quite trepidly. Again, with experience, once you get used to the, the, the different modes, manual mode may, may be one of the ones that you go to. And in manual mode, you, you don't use exposure compensation. What recommendations would I make for you for wildlife photography when it comes to camera modes? If you're a beginner, I would urge you to get off any of the automatic or custom modes as soon as possible. I would then recommend you to try aperture priority. Remember we talked about depth of field and the exposure triangle and how important it is in wildlife photography. And then once you get used to aperture priority, then think about manual mode and auto ISO. You have a lot more control over it. Once you've set your aperture, once you've set your ISO, really all I do then is concentrate on my shutter speed. We've looked at camera metering, we've looked at the camera modes. What else is there in our camera system that can help us to assess the exposures that we're taking? Well, there's two things that I want to talk to you about. Firstly, the histogram. Histograms can seem quite complicated to begin with, but they're, they're relatively quite simple. They're just a graphical representation of the tonal range, remember we talked about the tonal range and the, the grayscale of your image that helps you to evaluate that exposure. The aim being that what you want to do within the sides of the histogram, you want to keep all the data and all the pixels inside it. You don't want the data, which is the pixels, the, the, the graph, touching either the left hand side or the right hand side. If you do that, you're in danger of losing data, in other words, pixels from your image. So what we'll do is we'll look at three images balanced against a, a histogram and what they mean. So the first one we're looking at is an overexposed image. And what we've got here is images overexposed. We can see that the data is all the way over to the right hand side, meaning that it is overexposed. If it touches the side, you're in danger of losing that data. The next one we'll look at is an underexposed image and it's vice versa from the overexposed. In this example, the data is all the way over to the left hand side and is touching the side of the histogram. Thereby, again, you're losing pixels, you're losing data. Once your data is touching those sides, you're in danger of, on the left hand side, where it's underexposed, of losing shadows and not being able to recover them. And on the right hand side, losing your highlight detail. Ideally what we're looking for is this final image here which is a balanced exposure. This is the, 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 the safest exposure that we're after whereby none of the pixels or the data are touching the sides of the histogram and it's much easier in post-processing to actually use your shadows and your highlights to, to, to get the balanced exposure that you're after and it also ensures that your images are neither too dark or too bright. Remember there's no such thing as a perfect histogram it's simply a, a, geogra a graphical representation of the tones that we looked at in the grayscale that your image has been exposed to. When do we actually use them? Well, we can use them in two places. We can either use them out in the field as we're taking images. We can refer to the histogram to see if we're um, overexposing or underexposing our images. And I tend to use them mainly uh, in post-processing to make sure that I've got a good balanced exposure. Checking the histogram in the field um, as I said, it allows you to adjust the settings. It then allows you to think about, do you need to use any exposure compensation? And again, we'll cover that in part three. But there is another camera function that we can use to help us assess our exposures while we're actually out in the field. And that's called your highlight alerts. Highlight alerts are also known as things like zebras, blinking highlights or blinkies. All I'm going to re refer to them is simply as blinkies. And they tell you immediately that you are blowing the highlights in your exposure. What the blinkies are showing is that your data has breached the right hand side of your histogram and you're going to lose data that you're not going to be able to recover, in other words highlights. How do we set our blinkies? Well, depending on your camera, there will be a function that you need to go to to set your blinkies so that you're alerted as you're taking photographs that you're clipping your highlights. And you can use different colours I set mine to red, I think I can set them to blue and green as well, but I've set mine to red. But by having your blinky set in your camera, yeah, you're letting the camera show you that you are overexposing your 
images and you're in danger of losing data. They then allow you to then make the adjustments that you're going to need um, through exposure compensation. So what would I recommend? Well, modern day cameras can display the histogram actually in the viewfinder as you're using it, but it can be quite difficult to, to assess the minor detail. Personally, I prefer to monitor my blinkies. They instantly tell you that you're clipping your highlights and you can then make your adjustments through exposure compensation. It will probably be down to which method you prefer and the one that you're going to prefer, you're only going to prefer through practicing using and reading your histogram and using and reading your blinkies. But for me, I prefer blinkies out in the field and I prefer my histogram when I'm doing my post-processing at my computer. Okay, to summarise so far in this three-part series of wildlife photography and looking at exposure settings. In part one, we looked at the exposure triangle and the relationship between aperture, shutter speed and ISO. In this part two, we've looked at the different exposure modes, whether it's through the light meter, the camera modes, we've looked at the histogram and we've looked at the blinky which will allow us to adjust our exposures and that's going to lead us into part three which is going to be about exposure compensation. So I look forward to meeting you then. So until the next time all I would ask is that if you've liked this video could you consider hitting the like button? Could I also ask you that if you've not subscribed to my channel Kevin Hartley Photography that you consider doing so. It's completely free it just helps me to grow my channel. I'm loving it at the moment. I'm just short of 2,000 subscribers, which I never believed I would get anywhere near. Uh, and that just amazes me that I've, I've managed to do that. And as I said, I just want to keep growing this channel to help um, people not make the mistakes that I did. And we all started somewhere and we all make mistakes and we all learn from them. And hopefully somebody out there has learned from this three-part series that I'm working on at the moment. So until the next time, stay safe, take care and hope to see you soon. Bye for now.